Hello, hello! I am Halsey Lion, and today it is my great pleasure to welcome you to episode 13 of Bandit's Ballads. 13 is considered by many to be the most unlucky number, and in my personal life, that's always been the case. But it is also often said that people make their own luck, so today we shall see whether the myth of 13 becomes a self fulfilling prophecy. With that out of the way, you know what time it is. It's time for a recap, so Balon Blacktide paid the iron price for everything he's achieved thus far. His massive wealth, a veritable arsenal, the gang he leads, and even the heart of a big Sturgeon lady. Not in the literal sense, he's not a complete psychopath. No, Zvana was so impressed by the exploits of our bandit lord that she's seriously considering taking him as husband. Before she gives us an answer, we must wait for a little while, and what better way to pass the time other than raiding some caravans? Six of them were swept away by the Black Tide. And not only were they carrying valuable cargo, but even the caravan guards themselves brought a hefty ransom. I also seized another opportunity to train my combat proficiency, but to be honest, I kind of uh, overtrained to the point of exhaustion and not just once or twice, but every time. Good thing I have protective equipment that prevents these minor injuries from becoming life-threatening. Last thing I've done before proposing marriage to Zvana was participate in a tourney that took place in the city of Tial. Perhaps if I distinguish myself in the arena, Milady will be more likely to accept my marriage proposal. Now, I'm a big strong lad who can fold his enemies like an origami, but because of my injuries, I could not afford to take unnecessary risks. So I played it safe and smart. In the first round I was given a bow, but because it didn't offer any protection, I ditched it for the spear and shield dropped by my competition, and with the help of these tools, I managed to emerge on top. Round 2, Throne Axes Duel. I sidestepped those aimed at me from afar, waited for my opponent to get close, and did a better job than him. Round number 3, Axe and Shield Duel against my companion. Gertlind the Huntress. I must thank her for taking a dive and allowing me to win. Not like she had much of a choice in the matter. And finally, in round 4, there was another Throne Axes duel. This time, I also picked up those that my competitor threw at me and returned to sender. I wasn't going to try to fight in melee, I'm not a parry master. With my new title of Arena Champion, I headed back to Uruk Skala Castle and proposed to Zvana. Not before giving her another small gift, to slightly stack the odds in my favor. Unlike our first date, this was not a walk in the park. In fact, there was a real possibility that she would reject me, in which case I would have had to repeat the process with another lady. Something I was not particularly keen on. For some reason, one of her deal breakers was that I, uh, lack the income to support her long term plans. Okay, so 878,000 dinars is not enough. Apparently, if you're not a millionaire, Zvana doesn't like your broke ass. Good thing my gorgeous face and gargantuan height met her high standards. Because of my impressive physique, I was able to overcome her gold-digging instincts and she accepted my proposal on the condition that I discuss the final terms of this union with her father, Godin, who is all the way back in Batania. It took me almost a week to track him down and as I was making my way there, I sold a few things in the Sturgeon towns I passed through and recruited whatever gangs of raiders found themselves in my path. For a mere 5,000 dinars, Godun was willing to offer me his daughter's hand in marriage. I gave him 50,000, got engaged, and then prepared for another lengthy journey across Sturgia to pick her up and officiate the wedding ceremony. But why boringly travel through Sturgia when I could instead pass through the territories of the Northern Empire and wreak havoc in my path? 
My first victims were some mercenaries of Vlandian origin, whose defeat rewarded me a masterwork crossbow that I will surely put to good use when I finally lay siege to my first castle. After this, I pacified the militia of whatever villages I passed through, and then caught another two mercenary warbands, who were graced by my presence. My men took care of all the recent battles up till now, which is why I didn't describe them. Turns out the noises of violence have a calming effect on me as they helped me take a few good hours of sleep. Not much of note happened during this battle. My soldiers did what they always do, while I quickly eliminated an elite cataphract and then had a lengthy discussion with one of the mercenary captains who stubbornly resisted my rhetoric for about half a minute, which felt like an eternity in the context of a battle, until my javelins made a compelling argument for why he should get some sleep as well. Because I was not in a murderous mood, I released both enemy captains and then proceeded to towards my destination, a bit richer than before, thanks to all the loot. Shortly after that, I caught someone else. Not a dirty mercenary, but a proper lord of the Northern Empire. Ascheron, the no. son of former no, no, Emperor no, 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 no. Lucan. His 40 men didn't stand a chance against my 150, but I really liked his manners called me a man of valor and said it would be an honor to cross swords. So I honored his request and rode forth to meet him in the field and if he were to defeat me in a duel, I would let them all go. Before I did, however, some of his riders came forth and one of them poked me with his pointy stick. My men did not observe who knocked me off my horse, but they had clear orders not to engage if I were to fall, and so that brave rider saved his bodies from extinction that day. It's a shame I did not get to duel Ascheron, maybe some other time. As I continued on my travels, I robbed a group of peasants, extorted another, murdered a third and briefly considered allowing this group of 55 looters to continue to exist. But then I thought to myself, if I don't kill them, someone else will. Besides, the survivors will learn that it's not safe for thieves to travel in such large groups. After that incident, I even participated in another training session, but I told you earlier how that went for me. Last but not least, I had a little chat with Lucala, niece of Germana, who was one of my captors back when I was struggling to survive during my first few days on this continent. It was a catch and release type of deal. I taught the young lady a lesson so that her clan learns to avoid me from now on. When I returned to Urixkala, my fiancé told me she's heard all about my string of recent victories and she's very impressed. So impressed, in fact, that she wants the wedding right here and now in the castle, without wasting any more time going into the big city. As my lady wishes. After exchanging vows and kneeling in front of each other, we were declared man and wife and we spent a few hours just uh, celebrating the occasion. Being a servant of the drowned god gained another meaning that day. But there's much work to be done, so I had Zvana join my crew and we departed to fight against the Northern Empire. I still have some scores to settle. First, I wanted to see how she handles herself in a fight against looters. Not too great, unfortunately, but at least she found her own way of praying to the drowned god. Thanks to her armor, she only got a few minor bruises that would heal in a couple of days, but I need to get her better armor. The only way I know how. All in due time. For now, we have to fight the Imperial Bastards who captured me. I know of one whose head would look really good mounted on a pike. First one I caught was not my intended it's target, Nekasaur, although I prefer calling him Scarface. My men likely gave him another scar after putting his soldiers into the ground. My next victim was another mercenary captain who tragically could not reach the gates of Umbrella before I caught him. He did after I killed his men and took him prisoner because I had to sneak into town and give him to the ransom broker. Better to have 10,000 in the bank than a speed penalty. But before I reached the city of Mizea, where my nemesis was hiding, I ran into another lord who I wanted to attack, Tassinor. 
I technically could have sent my soldiers to fight without my supervision, but I needed my party at full strength if I were to defeat my intended target. As for the battle against Tassinor, nothing out of the ordinary except for the fact that I killed five of his people and then personally knocked my lord out. I really enjoy humiliating these lords who think they're safe, surrounded by their soldiers, only to suddenly find themselves flying for several meters, propelled by my javelins. Without their thick lamellar plates, the nobles would definitely be dead on the spot, however, Tassinor was lucky. Instead of being sent to the afterlife, he just got sent far away from me. Next time I hope he brings better loot. Shortly after, I ran into the kinsman of the lord I was hunting, Lantanor. Just like Tassinor before him, he got to sample my javelins, but unlike his predecessor, he got captured. Maybe I'll take his head off, maybe he'll witness his clanmate lose his. For now, I must wait for that coward to leave his city. To pass the time, I went west, to explore and see if I can plunder some villages or fight other lords. Well, there's the villages of Orthra and Vealos, but because their inhabitants were willing to sell me my first horse, I promised to never attack them. If someone else burns them to the ground, even my own people, I won't intervene, but me personally? Out of the question. But it's not like I could have gotten to Orthra anyway, even if I wanted to, because a couple of Archons and their 241 men were standing in my way. So I made a tactical retreat towards Mizea, and just as I did, my target burst out through the gates. Gifor, the man who killed my original Ironborn warband, took me captive and tortured me. He's as good as dead, but it seems he will only chase me as long as his two buddies are around. If I'm defeated now, Zvana will become a widow. No, I can't do this to her. I must run and catch Gifor when his friends aren't around. For now, we can calmly walk back through the forest and occasionally stop to murder some mercenaries. Soon I was back in Tial, where I ransomed my prisoners, got all the town's money by selling some looted weapons, and then resolved to wait in town until the threat has passed. Just like the coward I was criticizing. When Gifor was gone, I chased after two of his butt buddies, hoping to catch them both and wipe them out at the same time, unfortunately. They broke up and I could only attack one of them. The fight was easier, sure, but I'd rather round them up and kill them all. Or injure. I'm not a monster, but things happen in the heat of battle. Oh well, Epiferia's party will have to suffice, and because she had the goal to survive this fight, I uh, sent her on her merry way. The ransom she would have paid is not worth the time it takes to drag her back in town. Soon as her army was crushed, more imps crossed the border into Sturgia, but I was already gone. Most of them left as soon as I got in town, but Gifor made the deadly mistake of lingering around and since he was lost in a forest, he was easy to catch. Like a rat in a trap. But I waited for daylight to arrive. I need to look him in the eye when I deal the killing blow. I've dreamt about this moment for years. When I caught him, he uh, did not even remember me. Is he pretending? Apparently not, he gave me his name, his title, and told me he's wary of strangers. It appears that his Alzheimer's is genuine. Well, seems to me like it's a crueler fate to just leave his head attached. I'm uh, really conflicted about this. Let's just fight and hope he dies on the battlefield. He'd be doing me a real solid if he did that. Before the battle began, however, I took Zvana's Druznik lance because its craftsmanship is of better quality than the spear I was wielding up to that point. I mean, I paid the iron price for the wife, her gear belongs to me now. She's only allowed to wear what I deem to be appropriate for her. Anyway, the battle itself was conducted according to standard procedure with one minor exception. While my men wait for their orders, I shall ride forth and kill as many Imperials as I possibly can, because this is personal. The first to fall were the skirmishers, who thought their bows and mounts keep them safe. Not from me. I then glanced at their infantry, who formed a circle around the archers and their boss. 
Reaching him would have been difficult were it not for his arrogance. I don't know how Gifor is still alive after that, but it's rather inconvenient. Whatever, his soldiers have yet to evacuate my battlefield, so I need to manually remove each of them from this plane of existence. Next on my naughty list was the cavalry, because if left unattended, they can deal heavy damage to my archers. The lance was serviceable for a while, but my sword was a lot more effective in close quarters and I could finish the job with a javelin when one of them attempted to ride off. With the biggest threat removed, I turned my attention to the footmen while at the same time my own soldiers were making their approach. The javelins were devastating. With enough momentum they can one-shot even the most well-armored opponents, let alone these peasants. But I eventually grew bored of shooting fish in a barrel, so I drew my sword and introduced the concept of mass layoffs to the land of Calradia. One after the other, Gifor's soldiers fell before my blade and the bodies were piling up. Up till now I was under the impression that a spear is an absolute requirement if you wish to be useful from the saddle because swords don't have quite the same reach. Oh, how wrong I was. Sure, it's harder to hit people with a sword, but if you get the angle just right, it's a lot faster. Of course, versus infantry, there's always the chance of your horse getting spooked by their spears, so it makes sense to use a polearm. But archers should always be put to the sword. After a bit of left swiping, enemy morale broke and a few attempted to flee, but I was already in the zone, so to speak, and I couldn't just let that happen. And so, victory was declared. A flawless victory, I might add, with nary a casualty on our side, well, except for one of the lads who fainted when he saw me covered in blood. He'll be fine. As for my performance during this fight, I've put 31 Imperials into the dirt. I'd be prouder of this accomplishment if I fought actual warriors instead of unarmored peasants, but it's not my fault Gifor chose his soldiers poorly. As the snow was covering the broken bodies of my fallen enemies, Archon Gifor still dared to draw breath in my presence. So I lined him up for execution, grabbed my wife's battle axe and even took my helmet off, hoping he'd recognize me, but uh, still nothing. My arch nemesis kneels right in front of me, about to get his head chopped off, and he just uh, accepted his fate like a docile lamb? Now I don't even want to kill him anymore, he's just pitiful, a sorry sight. Uh, this would have been easier if I was like the rest of the Ironborn, but truth is, I've never killed anyone who didn't have a weapon in his hand. Not before today. Hmm. No. This insect does not deserve the mercy of my foot. I believe it's far crueler to leave him alive, and fearful of the day when my bloodlust is stronger than my code, because every time I see him, I will make it my priority to hunt him down and kill him in battle. Begone, worm. This is enough compensation for the misery you've caused me. Well, be gone from my sight. I didn't release him, I just had my men put a burlap sack over his sorry head, planning to give him to the ransom broker. If I see him financially ruined, that would make me feel a lot better than just removing him from the gene pool. But enough pondering. The decision is taken. Gifor shall live until we meet again. I hope the next battlefield wound he takes is fatal, if not, that means the Drowned God wants him alive for some purpose. But I still bear a grudge towards the Northern Empire. Gifor may have been the first to imprison me, but a lot of other Imperials kept chasing me down every time I managed to escape. If nobody minds, I'll continue my rampage against them for a little while longer. But we haven't talked about the loot I've sto uh, taken from Gifor. To be honest, the only remarkable piece of equipment was this cavalry male shirt, although I guess I've turned it into a cavalry female shirt since I gave it to Zvana. The rest was useless trash that I just sold for profit to the merchants of Tial. Not long after, I crushed the party of Olipos, then gave Nikki another scar and put another 16 of his people into the fucking ground. And I'm proud to announce that this was another battle where we've had zero casualties. 
And because of all the battles I have won, Clan Blacktide was now renowned across the continent and recognized as a potential ruler for these lands. For the time being, however, I will put those foolish ambitions to rest because I still have a lot more Imperials to murder before a crown is laid upon my brow. It didn't take long to come across my next batch of victims, but after giving Miron a proper beatdown, I left in search for more recruits. My newfound fame is allowing me to field an even bigger army. The way it works is a bit like this. If some random guy has 100 friends around, you're going to be reluctant to go there and introduce yourself. But if you recognize that random guy as someone you look up to, you'll be more than eager to join his entourage. The more people have heard of you, the bigger the crowd you can attract. It's how fame works. In the middle of my conscription spree, I ran into an important political figure of the Northern Empire. Penton, son of Drosios Neretzes. The last man to rule the united Calradian Empire before it splintered into the three squabbling factions that I'm profiting off of. Or was he second to last, Great Emperor? I don't know and I don't really care. What I care about is having a duel with Penton. Imagine if instead of sending men to kill one another and set the lands on fire, the leaders of this world just fought each other over whatever scraps they're competing for. That's unfortunately not how the world works. Largest military usually wins, which is why I have gathered a faithful crew. Still, despite my lower numbers, I have better troops and I can win this battle if I really want to. But I'll give Penton a chance to prove his worth and if I fall, he's allowed to walk away. This time. So I rode towards the enemy, impaled two of his horse archers, and lowered my lance to hit him with full force. A well-placed strike of his sword took my breath away and I fell from my horse to the disappointed looks of my crew who were really hoping for a big payday. But they had specific orders, so they came to my rescue and let Penton walk away. I, however, was not satisfied by this outcome, so I quickly recruited a nearby band of forest bandits, administered some first aid, and prepared for round two against Penton. This time I killed another two of his horse archers and prepared to meet the would-be emperor up on the hill where he was standing ready for our duel. I've never seen anyone more majestic. If I didn't get an arrow shot through my leg by one of his damned archers, I might have even knelt in front of him and sworn fealty, but now we have to fight. Unfortunately, this was not a proper duel because his bowmen kept peppering me with arrows as I tried to fight their lord. After some time, I wanted to just kill his horse so that we can fight each other on foot, but in my attempt to do that, he sliced my shoulder and then ran towards his archers. Because I was losing my patience, I ordered my men to get closer so that we may thin the herd while I still attempted to have my duel. After that order was given, I got the brilliant idea to climb back on the hill, dismount and allow Penton to charge towards me with his horse so that I can kill it with my lance and then fight each other but just as I did, I got knocked out by an arrow and thus the second round was lost as well. My crew was getting annoyed by my performance but earlier they saw me easily dismantle dozens of enemies in a single fight and many of my men owe their lives to my bloody contributions. They won't let a couple mistakes stain their image of me. We'll get pent on next time and then we'll drown in riches. After my soldiers pulled back, I proceeded to stalk Penton until I was ready for round 3, but in the meantime, another Imperial officer showed up, so I had to keep my distance. Maybe I can take on two enemy parties at the same time, but only if I can directly control the fight. I don't trust my men to win such a battle on their own. Good warriors, not such great tacticians. As I was running away, more and more parties showed up and began chasing me, but thanks to this forest, I can easily maintain a safe distance. For some time, I kept an eye out for more bandits to recruit into my gang, but because none showed up, I began conscripting lads from nearby imperial villages. I need soldiers for the next step of my plan. What is the next step, you may wonder? You'll find out soon enough 
for now I want to tell you about this strange encounter that I had. There was this imperial lady, Panalea, who was leading a party of 104 soldiers, but as soon as she saw my black banner approaching, the party was instantaneously reduced to a mere 20 men with no leader. I was wondering, what the hell happened? Did she spontaneously combust? Apparently not, according to the locals. She's still alive, but is now a fugitive. My guess is she's done the same thing I always do when I'm trapped. Leave a few men behind to cover my escape. Smart. Of course, I couldn't let those soldiers walk away with all their loot, but he already knew that about me. It didn't need to be specified. As for the next step in my master plan, you see, I'm tired of being chased around by all these enemies who outnumber me. What I need to do is find terrain that allows me to fight against overwhelming odds. The cliffs around Makeb look promising and with the imps in hot pursuit, it was time to leave them there and take a closer look at the battle terrain. By the time I got there, however, most of my pursuers gave up, so I was back on the offensive. Didn't take me long to catch someone. Epiferia, who, unlike last time, had a friend around to give her a hand. This was by far the longest battle I've ever fought up to this point, lasting almost 17 minutes and not necessarily because it was difficult, but because I insisted upon personally taking the lives of as many Imperials as possible. When it was all said and done, I had a kill count of 48. Horse archers, elite cataphracts and even the lords themselves have fallen before me. All because I followed some very simple rules. Would you like to know those rules? It's gonna cost you one of your thumbs. The first three are about the equipment you have. Ride a fast horse, wear heavy armor, and wield the finest weapons. It's pretty common sense, but when you consider the fact that the vast majority of people on this land are either peasants or looters, you'll realize they break these three simple rules. Rule number four is to keep your distance from enemy archers until they're distracted, and only fight the enemies who are foolish enough to leave the range of their covering fire. Rule number five, exploit your enemy's weaknesses. For example, horse archers have a really hard time shooting behind themselves, so you can easily catch up to them and stab them in the back, if you follow rule number one. Rule number six, play to your strengths. I don't know if I can joust against a cataphract and win, simply because they have longer speeders, so if I'm not 100% sure I can win the joust, I simply block his attack, switch to my sword, close the distance and then wail on him. And the seventh rule, avoid fighting infantry from horseback. I already mentioned this to you earlier. There's a lot more rules that I have not mentioned, but because I adhered to the first seven, I've not only won the battle, but even remained standing till it was over, despite the many cuts and bruises I have suffered. In spite of my best efforts, unfortunately, three of my ironborn have lost their lives, but those that survived had their confidence in me renewed after my blunders against Penton. But the real reward of this victory was not the loot, no. It was the knowledge that this terrain is exactly what I need in order to break armies three times larger than mine. I once said that I will one day rule over Ortizia, but I believe Makeb is a much more valuable prize from a tactical standpoint. After the battle was over, it was time to move on, but all of a sudden, several Imperial parties came from the north. Now, I could have played it safe and fled south, but there comes a point in every man's life when he has to be tested. The moment of truth. So I've decided to stand my ground and let the Imperials approach, and see whether I can actually use this terrain to my advantage or perish because of a small miscalculation. As a last ditch effort to wiggle out of this fight, I wanted to find out whether Serenor is willing to pay me to make peace. He is, unfortunately. He's not the head of his household. Maritios is, and he was defeated in the previous battle. Oh well, death before dishonor. With arms wide open, I welcomed this challenge and we shall see how it went in the next episode because this one has gone on for way longer than I planned. Quite the cliffhanger, eh?
Anyway, before we bring this chapter to an end, let's see what Balon has accomplished in these last couple of months. He earned a bit more money, proved his worth as a warrior by killing a lot of Imperial soldiers and defeating several lords, got humbled by a couple of those lads, took his sweet revenge, somewhat, on the man who first threw him in prison and most importantly, he got married to a giant lady who'll give him many children who are destined to grow into great big monsters who will conquer the whole world. I'd say that's some pretty good progress. And now that Balon's current chapter has concluded, I would like to give you a quick heads up regarding my future content. As you know, this series isn't doing too well in terms of views, but even so, I would like to finish it. And if I can do that in time, I'm going to get ready to cover some upcoming games. 2023 is packed with new releases, which bring with them many opportunities for me to grow this channel. I can't complain, thanks to you my channel is in a pretty comfortable position at the moment, but it can't hurt to try to make it a bit more profitable. I do like money, after all. And if everything goes well, I have a lot more Bannerlord videos planned, so stay tuned. Anyway lads, we're done for today. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video in its entirety, it means a lot to me, and you better be ready for the next one. Goodbye for now.